between the respiratory system. So for a basic structure, the respiratory system is actually very similar to a tree. If you inverted it, um, and if it were totally hollow. So if you flipped a tree upside down, then the leaves of the tree would be comparable to the alveoli, um, which are the microscopic sacs that are enclosed by a capillary, by um, a bed of capillaries. And that's because you could see here, this here would be the trunk splitting out into branches, smaller and smaller and smaller, and then the little leaves on the end as the alveoli. So that's just really to create a visual image to let you kind of be able to picture it in somebody. So diffusion is really the main purpose of your respiratory system. And that's the mode for which gas is exchanged um, from the air that you breathe into your circulatory system so that oxygen can be carried to your tissues. So your membrane mucosa this is the membrane that lines the um, air distribution tubes of your respiratory system. And there's a ton of mucus that is produced each day. And this forms a mucus blanket, which covers your whole like lining of your respiratory system. So if you remember back, we talked about how mucus is important because it um, kind of creates like a lubrication and a softening of those tissues. And the other thing that it's important for, if you remember from our immune chapter, is nonspecific immunity because that mucus is going to trap bacteria that you happen to breathe in so that you can then cough or sneeze it up and get it out of your body. So mucus serves as that air purification system. And not only for bacteria, but other irritants like dust or pollen. You also have Cilia on your mucus cells, cilia are little finger-like projections that are going to beat upwards in one direction, and that's to help keep mucus moving up towards um, the pharynx so that you can then cough or sneeze it out so that that mucus that's trapped, those irritants, can be expelled from your body. And that's just a picture here where you can see the tissue. It's a nice thick mucus layer up here. And these are your little your little scylla, those little fingers that are sticking out. So they're going to beat in one direction to try to um, expel all of that mucus that contains the irritants. So for your respiratory system, um, one of the first structures that we'll get to is the nose. And your nose is just the area where you're going to breathe in air. It has one of the biggest openings to the outside system. Your nose has a septum that divides your interior nose into two cavities. And this is a mucus lined um, cavity because remember mucus lines any cavity that's open to general air. Um, and one of the complications that can happen here is that you can develop um, nasal polyps, which are just non-cancerous growths that project out from the nasal mucosa. So what's the function of your nose? Well, it warms and moistens the air that you inhale, so that by the time it reaches your lungs, it's more like of an ideal temperature and moisture level, so it doesn't hurt your lungs. Um, and it also contains your sense of smell. So there you can see the sinuses, which drain into your nose. So next, if we travel down, is your pharynx. Your pharynx, which is also known as your throat, is about five inches long. It's divided into three sections. There's your nasopharynx, your oropharynx, and, the, and your laryngeal pharynx. And those are ordered according to the structure that you're next to. So your, um, the back of your nasal passage opens into your oropharynx. The back of your mouth, or your nasopharynx, my apologies on that one, um, the back of your mouth opens up into your oropharynx. And then your leningopharynx is what they both kind of go down into right before your larynx. Um, so like we said, both of your nasal cavities, your mouth, and even your esophagus and larynx, as well as your auditory tubes, all have openings into your pharynx. Um, 
So the structure is that you have your pharyngeal tonsils, remember those from the immune chapter, that, um, and the openings of your auditory tubes that both open up into your narrow pharynx, and that's the part of your pharynx right behind your nose. Um, and then you have more tonsils that are found in your oropharynx. And then just like with your nose, it's a mucous membrane that lines this part of your respiratory system as well. And that's because we're dealing with air from the outside world. Anytime air from the outside world, it's a mucous membrane. And there you can just see the picture. So um, here you have your nasal cavity. And then you have your nasopharynx is back here. Your oral cavity is right here. And your oropharynx, and then down here would be your laryngopharynx, because this would be your trachea, and then this is your esophagus. So what are the functions of your pharynx? Well, your pharynx is a passage for both food and liquids. It's also a passage for air, and it contains your tonsils, which are those masses of lymphoid tissue that um, provide that first line of defense, that first line of immunity that we talked about in our immune chapter. Right after your pharynx is your larynx, hence the laryngopharynx. Um, the structure of this is, is just below your pharynx, um, and this is the part of the body that they also refer, refer to as your voice box. This contains several pieces of cartilage that form a framework. Um, it's your Thyroid cartilage is the largest one, and that's the one that you see as a kind of a large protruding ring that gets referred to as the Adam's apple a lot. It also has another piece of cartilage called the epiglottis, which partially covers the opening into the larynx. And the whole purpose of your epiglottis is it protects your larynx from food going down there. So this is also a mucus lined cavity because it's exposed to air, right? And your vocal cords stretch across the interior of your larynx. Um, and the space between your vocal cords is called the glottis. And the reason why they are there is that as air passes through them, it creates a vibration that comes out as a sound. So that's what makes your voice. So here you can see, um, this is your trachea here in the middle. These are your vocal cords right here. And that's your epiglottis. Your epiglottis will cover this when you're swallowing, but these vocal cords tense and relax to make noises as the air passes through them. So the functions, it's a passageway for air to move to and from the lungs, and it also functions for voice production. So one of the things that can go wrong here is that you can get laryn um, laryngeal cancer. Um, so the instance of this definitely increases with age and alcohol. Most of the time it's seen in men over the age of 50. Um, and what it's normally causes or the signs that you see are a hoarseness in somebody's voice because they've lost some of their ability to adapt their vocal cords. And they also start to have a difficult time swallowing because it's stiff or they have a tumor there. And so the epiglottis just doesn't cover your glottis as well. Sometimes what has to happen is your larynx actually has to be removed due to the extent of the cancer, and that causes esophageal speech, which is basically when there's uh, an electric artificial larynx needed for speech. Um, also, people who oftentimes get this kind of cancer are those who have smoked or done chewing tobacco, something where there's another cancer-causing agent in your mouth or in your throat. So moving down, um, or not really moving down, but continuing on with other problems that can happen with your upper respiratory tract, because so far we've just been covering a very high up upper portion of your respiratory tract, you can have rhinitis. So rhinitis is nasal inflammation, such as what you would get if you have the cold or flu or an allergy. So this can be a let, um, infectious, which would be if you have the cold or the flu, or it can just be an allergic reaction, which is just like making your nose run and become inflamed. Um, then you can also have pharyngitis. This is what the common sore throat is called. So it's either an infection or just inflammation of your pharynx. <clears throat> and then you could have laryngitis. 
Laryngitis is inflammation of the larynx, which results from infection or irritation of your, um, of your larynx or of the vocal cords. Two other types that can happen here are that you can have epiglottitis, which is a swelling of your epiglottis. Now this can actually become life-threatening because your epiglottis blocks your, um, your trachea when you swallow so that you don't um, breathe in food. But if your epiglottis becomes swollen and actually swells closed, it can actually occlude your airway. Um, or you can have croup, which is some in inflammation in this area, but it's not life-threatening. It doesn't occlude your airway. So some anatomical problems that can happen, you can have a deviated septum, and that's when the septum that is abnormal, meaning that it's not centered on your mid-sagittal plane, and that can either be congenital or acquired, it normally doesn't cause any problems. You can, um, you can also have, um, you can also have a bloody nose, which is called epistaxis, and that's either a result from a mechanical injury or hypertension in those nasal blood vessels or some other factor that has weakened the integrity of those blood vessels so that they start to bleed. So just below those, on the other side of your epiglottis and your vocal cords, you have your trachea. Your trachea is a tube that's also referred to as your windpipe and it extends from your larynx down into your thoracic cavity. This is also a mucus lined tube and it's created by these C-shaped rings of cartilage that hold your trachea open. And the reason why those are important are because there's a lot of air pressure changes there and if it didn't have those cartilage rings to help keep it open, it would actually collapse with the pressure changes. So they just help keep the trachea shape. And the function of your trachea is really just for air movement in and out of the lungs. And there you can see a picture where this is your mucus lining on the inside, down your trachea. And here you can see all those rings that are helping to keep its shape. So what happens when your trachea becomes obstructed? Well, a blockage of the trachea occludes the airway. Um, and if it's complete, and not addressed, it can actually cause death in minutes. And that's what we call choking. And choking causes more than 4,000 deaths every year in this country alone. And if you know somebody's choking, we do the Heimlich maneuver, which is also called abdominal thrusts. And this is a life-saving technique that's used to create pressure below the trachea so that it actually forces whatever might be lodged in your trachea up and out. So if somebody has an issue with their trachea or an issue with their upper airway, what might need to be done is actually a tracheostomy. A tracheostomy is a surgical procedure where we put a tube through an incision um, in between the cartilage into somebody's trachea so that they can breathe past a blockage in their airway. So if somebody has, let's say they have some issues with their um, epiglottis, so now their epiglottis isn't working correctly and they can't pass air by it. We might need a trachea. So, or um, a trachea, a tracheostomy. Everybody has a trachea. <laughs> um, so it's just this tube. You can see where it's a plastic tube that's just inserted into the neck, angles downwards towards the lungs, and then there's this balloon that's inflated um, to hold pressure so that the air can't go around that plastic tube, it has to go in and out through it. So the structure further down is that your trachea branches into right and left bronchii. So where it branches are the bronchii. Um, your right is the primary bronchus and that's because it's more vertical and a bit larger around than your left. So if you aspirate something, aspirate means that it, you breathe it in instead of it going down into your stomach. Um, oftentimes that is where it gets lodged, in your right bronchus versus your left. Um, and each bronchus continues to branch into smaller and smaller tubes. Um, those are called your secondary bronchi. 
and eventually it leads to the bronchioles, which are even smaller. So kind of how your arteries and veins have arterioles and venules, your bronchus branch into bronchioles. So the bronchioles end in these clusters of little microscopic alveolar sacs whose walls are made of um, alveoli and they're covered in capillaries because that's where the exchange of oxygen for carbon dioxide with your um, circulatory system is going to happen. So there you can see the picture where these are your little alveolar sacs and all your little alveoli it looks kind of like grapes. And that's the capillary bed that's surrounding them. So the function, your bronchii and bronchioles are just for air distribution. They continue to be a passageway of air from the outside of the body down into your alveoli so that the body can take in that oxygen. And then your alveoli. Your alveoli is where the exchange of gas between air and blood occurs. So what can go wrong here? Well, you can have respiratory distress, and this is the relative inability to inflate the alveoli. I know, kind of complicated, right? There are a couple of different types of this. You can have um, infant respiratory distress syndrome, and this happens in infants. Um, and this is the leading cause of death in premature infants, and it's because they don't have an adequate amount of surfactant around their alveoli. And surfactant is, it reduces surface tension, so it helps keep those alveoli inflated. So they can't actually keep their own alveoli inflated, which causes them to collapse. And if they collapse, well, then they can't get air. And then you can have adult respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and, and this, there are a lot of different kinds of this, but one of the things that people think happen are that there is an impairment of the surfactant um, by inhalation of foreign substances or whatever condition the person has. And so their alveoli also collapse. So what happens when you can't inflate your alveoli is that it's sort of like you've had grapes and you've made them into raisins. And the surface area on those raisins is a lot smaller and it's not very effective for gas exchange. So now, even if you're physically breathing adequately, you can't exchange an adequate amount of, of um, oxygen for carbon dioxide. So you're basically going to end up ultimately starving your body of oxygen. So your lungs and the pleura cavity. So your lungs are large enough to fill the chest cavity, except for that middle space where your heart and some of the very large vessels are located. The apex of your, um, of your lungs are the very narrow upper part. The apex is always the narrow part. So the apex of the heart is down, but the apex of the lungs are up. Where the lungs, the base is the very broad lower part, and that rests out on your diaphragm, which is also where the apex of your heart rests. So your heart and your lungs are a little bit, a little backwards in that sense. And here you can see where your left lung is divided into an upper and a lower lobe and your right lung is divided into a upper middle and lower lobe so your pleura your pleura is a moist and smooth very slippery membrane that's going to line your chest cavity and also covers the outer surface of your lungs and there's just a teeny bit of fluid in here. And what that does is it's actually used to reduce the friction between the lungs and the chest wall during breathing, during respiration, so that your lungs can expand and collapse back down when you breathe, and it doesn't cause any friction. It's what allows us to breathe easily and effectively. So this is just so that you can see. So here are the lungs. And there's the lining, that little pleural space, and then the lining of the cavity. And so those, that little bit of pleural space where there's a little bit of fluid actually works to help stick those two lined surfaces together. So it's kind of like if, if I have two pieces of glass and I put a drop of water between them, they stick together. I can slide them back and forth really easily, but I can't pull them apart. And that's how this works as well. It makes it so that when my chest cavity expands, it forces my lungs to expand as well. So what can go wrong here? Well, you can have a pleurisy. Pleurisy is an inflammation of the pleura. 
so of that that membrane lining around the your lungs or you can have atelectasis atelectasis is an incomplete expansion or a total collapse of your alveoli so that was kind of that grapes turning into raisins thing i was talking about and then you can also have a pneumothorax or a hemothorax now this is not a subcategory of atelectasis i just forgot to make the text bigger i guess um, and this is when there's the presence of air in your pleural space. So why that is such a really big problem is that remember how I was just talking about how um, the little couple drops of liquid that are located between your two membranes sort of glue them together? Well, if I put air in there, now they're not glued together anymore. So now when my chest cavity expands, Bands, it's not going to trigger my lungs to expand as much because there's air in that space so they're not glued together like they would be before or you can have a hemothorax hemothorax is when there is a presence of blood in that pleural space instead of just that kind of clear serous fluid or air it's actually blood so hemo right hemo is blood hemothorax blood in that pleural space and that's just a picture here where you can see that that's a pneumothorax and now there's air in this pleural space, which has actually caused this lung to collapse. Because remember how I said that if the lining of the, or the outer lining of the lung isn't glued to the inner lining of that cavity, it does not have to expand with it. So. Now that we've covered some of the anatomy, let's cover respirations very briefly. So respirations are the mechanics of breathing. So pulmonary ventilation includes two separate phases. There's inspiration, which is the air moving into the lungs, and expiration, which is the movement of air out of the lungs. So what causes, what causes this is a change in size and shape of the thorax that causes a change in air pressure within the cavity and um, in the lungs because as the volume of the lung cavity changes, so does the lungs because as long as there's not a pneumothorax, they're kind of glued together. And it's caused by a pressure change in the opposite direction. So if I expand my chest cavity, I've dropped the pressure in my lungs, which causes air to flood into them. Um, and, and air moves into or out of the lungs because of that pressure gradient. It wants to go to where there's the least amount of air pressure. So here you can see for inspiration, I have expanded my lungs, which means I've dropped the pressure. And for exhalation, I have um, contracted my lungs. I'm squeezing them, which is trying to force that air out. So how I do this is mainly by my diaphragm. So if I contract my diaphragm, my diaphragm is actually in this arched up shape, right? So if I contract my diaphragm, I drop it down, which actually reduces this pressure. If I relax my diaphragm, it recoils back up, squeezing up on my lungs just because that's where it normally wants to be, which increases this pressure and pushes the air out. So inspiration is actually the active process. So that's when my muscles increase the volume of my thorax, which means that they're contracting and making the thorax cavity bigger, which I know is kind of hard to think about muscles contracting to make the cavity bigger, but it's just because when it contracts, it pulls downward. So it decreases the lung pressure and causes air from the atmosphere to flow into my lungs. Um, so your inspiratory muscles are that diaphragm because it flattens, or you have your external intercostals. So these are some muscles that are located in between your ribs. And when they contract, they actually increase the, the size of your, they kind of pull your ribs out, which increases the size of your thorax cavity, dropping the pressure inside and causing air to flow in. Now for expiration, we want to reduce the size of our thoracic cavity. So to do that, we're going to relax our diaphragm, which is going to cause it to push up on our lungs because that elastic coil, it's very elastic tissue. So in, 
inhalation actually stretches the elastic. Expiration just relaxes it and lets it kind of spring back to the smaller shape that it wants to be in. And that increase in pressure actually pushes the air out because our, our thorax, our chest cavity, is just returning to its resting size and shape. Um, we do have some muscles that can help here as well, though, um, in case we need a little extra help with that exhalation. We have our internal intercostals, which are just to the inside of our external intercostals, which are used for inhalation. And when those muscles contract, they just squeeze in. So they make our rib cage get smaller and decrease the size of our thorax. Or your abdominal muscles. If you squeeze your abdominal muscles, you're going to push up on your diaphragm, decreasing the size of your thoracic or your chest cavity even more. So gas exchange in the lungs. So most of this we have talked about, so this should maybe just be a review, but carbon dioxide is what's going to move out of the lungs through the capillaries um, and into the alveoli, or alveoli air um, so that it can be expired out of the body, it can be exhaled. And oxygen is going to move from the alveoli um, in the lungs to the capillaries so that it can bind with the hemoglobin and then be carried to other parts of the body to be used as a nutrient. So there you can see just a picture. So we have unoxygenated blood is going to the alveoli, picking up oxygen and dropping off carbon dioxide, where it can go to the heart, get pumped out, where the opposite is going to happen. It's going to deposit the oxygen for the tissues to, to use and collect its carbon dioxide and then go back to the lungs. So the exchange of gas in the tissues, just like we were saying, that oxyhemoglobin, which is just a hemoglobin that is bound with oxygen, is going to break down into oxygen and hemoglobin. The oxygen moves out of the tissue capillary bed and into the cells because the cells use it as a vital nutrient. And in exchange, it is going to pick up carbon dioxide, which is your tissue's waste product. It combines with the carbon dioxide, um, so that it can carry it to the lungs so that it can be exhaled. So only a very small amount of blood is actually, or a small amount of oxygen is actually dissolved in the blood. Almost all of it combines with hemoglobin, forming oxyhemoglobin, and is carried around in the blood that way. Um, and same thing really with, with carbon dioxide for the most part. Um, some of it forms bicarbonate, actually more of it than anything else, but that's a, pr a product that our body makes. For the most part, that one we're not going to talk about. We just want to think about carbon dioxide as what your body exhales as a waste product. So the volumes of air exchange in the pulmonary ventilation. Um, this I don't expect you guys to know too, too much about. You probably, unless you do a lot of work in a pulmonary office someday, won't have to know most of this. But just so that you know what these terms are, um, the volumes of, of air that is exchanged, inhaled and then exhaled, can be measured using a spirometer. Tidal volume is the normal amount of air that we breathe in with every breath. The vital capacity, so that's tidal volume is just average breaths. Um, vital capacity is the largest amount of air that somebody can breathe in with one expir, breathe, um, breathe out with one expiration. So that is the absolutely largest amount of air. And your expiratory reserve is the difference between the two. So after I have, um, breathed out my tidal volume, the difference between that and breathing out as much as I possibly can, that is my reserve volume. Then I can also go the other way and have an inspiratory reserve volume. So that's the amount of air that after my normal tidal volume, I can forcibly inhale. So after a normal breath, if I force more air in, that is my inspiratory reserve. And then finally, you have your residual volume, which is the amount that will remain in your lungs even after you force everything out. You can never actually just blow off everything in your lungs. There's always a little bit of reserve there. And that's just for those of you who 
our visual learners to see. So this is my normal tidal volume. That's what I normally breathe. If I really force it out, and that's my little bit of residual, right? So to regulate respiratory patterns in the body, um, it, basically they are going to adjust by the demands of oxygen supply and of carbon dioxide removal. Um, and that's regulated by control centers in your brain. So remember how we talked about how you had chemoreceptors located in your body and they were going to sense things like pH and carbon dioxide? Well, they're going to tell your brain, well, you have too much carbon dioxide. So your brain will say, okay, lungs work faster. So that's one of the ways that your body regulates um, your respiratory rate. And these are located in your medullary centers and under resting conditions, normal rate for breathing is between about 12 and 18 breaths per minute. Um, so your pontine centers, um, as the conditions in your body vary, these centers are located in your pons and actually alter the activity of your medullary center, which is going to help to adjust your breathing rate. And your, your brain stem centers are influenced by the information by those sensory receptors, just like I was mentioning to you. So they're going to say not enough oxygen, too much carbon dioxide to either increase or decrease your respiratory rate based on what your body's needs are. And these are just so you can get a, a visualization. So here you see where the blood is leaving your heart via the aorta. And in here, you're going to have some chemoreceptors and they transmit up to your brain stem so that your brain stem can then trigger respiratory rate. Because remember how from the neuro section I said that your your brain stem really does those like basic functions, the things that we just don't have any control over, your brain stem saying, all right, um, heartbeat, keep breathing, that kind of stuff. So your cerebral cortex is voluntary, but it's a little bit limited um, in its control of your respiratory activity. So there are some receptors that are um, your receptors, sorry, that we mentioned before um, that influence your respiratory rate are your chemoreceptors. So like I said, these are going to um, act in response to your the amount of carbon dioxide that they sense, the amount of oxygen, and the acid level in the blood. And those are located in your, um, in your arteries that come right off of your heart. Then you also have some pulmonary stretch receptors. And those are going to trigger your brain to say how much your lungs are stretching. And that's just to help protect them so that you don't over inflate your lungs and actually cause damage. So there are a few different types of breathing patterns. Now that we know that you, you have some control over your breathing rate, even though most of it is subconscious, um, eupnea is just normal, regular breathing, regular rate, um, regular depth. Hyperventilation is when you breathe rapid and deep. Hyperventilation normally happens when your body is trying to either breathe in more oxygen or breathe out more carbon dioxide. Hypoventilation is very slow and shallow breathing, and that's normally when your body is trying to conserve carbon dioxide. Dyspnea is when it's labored or difficult, and orthopnea is when your um, dyspnea is relieved by moving into a more upright or sitting position. So it's related to your, your position. If you lie down, you can't breathe, but if you sit up, you can Apnea is when you actually stop breathing, apnea, right? Um, Cheyenne Stokes respiration is a cycle of alternating apnea and hyperventilation. This is normally associated with very, very sick um, critical patients. So they have an apneic spell, they stop breathing, and then they sort of hyperventilate to compensate, and then they become apneic again because they can't sustain that hyperventilation. And then respiratory arrest. Respiratory arrest is when you fail to resume breathing again after a period of apnea. Um, 
So for some disorders of your lower GI tract, you can have, or lower GI, lower respiratory tract, sorry, I'm like jumping ahead to the next chapter, um, of your lower respiratory tract. Um, you can have acute bronchitis, which is an inflammation of the bronchi, um, or the bronchi and the trachea. Normally this is caused by an infection, and oftentimes it's because you have an upper respiratory infection that is spread down. Another one would be pneumonia. Pneumonia is an acute infection in which the lung airways and the alveoli become plugged with very thick exudates. So it's like very, very thick, thick mucus. And it can actually plug up your respiratory system. Um, normally that's caused by an infection of either a bacteria, virus, or a fungi. And it's characterized by high fevers, chills, headaches, normally um, a very loud, loud cough that oftentimes starts to produce very, you can actually cough off that thick mucus, and oftentimes chest pain due to how, how intense their coughing is. And this is a picture where you can see um, the, this is a bronco pneumonia. You can see just a little bit of kind of plugging up here. And then this is a, um, a lobar pneumonia. So remember how we looked at the pictures of the lung lobes earlier? So this would be the left, because remember the left is the one that's divided into just an upper and a lower lobe. And see how this whole lobe is just thick and plugged. So that's a lobar pneumonia. It's a pretty intense lobar pneumonia. So another disorder would be tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is chronic and very highly contagious lung infection. Um, and it's characterized by the tuberculosis um, in, in the lungs. And it can progress to actually in, involve other tissues um, outside of the lungs and the pleura. So basically it's caused by inhaling or swallowing the droplets of the contaminated um, bacteria. And some early signs of it are just fatigue and chest pain, um, pleurisy, so that um, inflammation of your pleura, um, weight loss, fever. Oftentimes then they start developing a cough and um, bloody sputum when they cough. And this is, without treatment, can be fatal. Um, Another one that we see is restrictive pulmonary disorders, and these reduce the ability of the lung tissue to stretch during inflammation. So these are things like um, fibrosis, which is scarring, or an inflammation, which is swelling those tissues so that they've just lost some of their elasticity. Um, and there can be factors outside the lungs that cause this restrictive um, behavior and that would be like pain or an injury um, um, or, or a pleurisy that's that swelling um, or inflammation that's actually restricting how much the lungs can expand and as a result restricting breathing and then there is obstructive pulmonary disorders so the most common one here, these, um, these are just conditions that obstruct breathing. The most common one is COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. And that can develop from a pre-existing obstructive condition such as chronic bronchitis, emphysema, or asthma. So chronic bronchitis is a chronic inflammation of the bronchial tree. Emphysema is when you reduce the surface area of your lungs caused by rupture or alveoli damage. Um, or asthma, which is when there's reoccurring spasms of um, the airway. It's normally also accompanied by an increase in edema and mu mucus production in the area. But what happens here is they normally have both a hard time getting air in and a hard time getting air back out. So it's kind of like they just have a hard time moving air in general. So here are some pictures where you have a normal airway here, chronic bronchitis. So this is basically plugged by that thick mucus um, accumulation. And what happens is that it sort of hyperinflates these alveoli because the air can't move back out after it gets in.
and then there's asthma. So asthma does create mucus, but it also has all these spasms. So see how tight um, your airways are here? So not only are they plugged, but they're very tight. So not a whole lot of air can move through there, even if we got rid of the mucus, which still causes this hyperinflammation. And then finally, emphysema. And emphysema is a little bit different because what it does is it sort of overinflates these alveoli, but it overinflates them to the point where they basically can't recoil and get smaller again after. So they're just permanently overinflated. And then finally, lung cancer. Lung cancer is a malignant tumor of your lung tissue. And this is occasionally treatable with surgery or chemotherapy or radiation. Um, and most lung cancer are, is associated with smoking, which is why cigarettes come with a black label warning on them to warn people of that. Um, and lung cancer can be, it can be very serious and it can um, metastasize to other places. Um, and lung cancer is one of those things where it really just depends on which stage you catch it in, how treatable it is. And that brings us to the end of this respiratory section.